In this video, we're going to look a little more deeply at global illumination in V-Ray for SketchUp. Global illumination meaning the calculation of reflected light into a more natural lighting solution in SketchUp. I have here a folly little model, little architectural model with some undercut area happening here. And I have my shadows turned on. I'm going to set a time of day, let's say, where I have some deep shadows into this area here. And let's look at our global illumination controls in the asset editor. So I turn on the asset editor, I'm going to my settings. What I'm looking for initially is my global illumination tab. I have opened up this area to the right, which allows me to have more space to show my settings. And I have two important switches here. I have a switch to advanced, which is more options to control, and a switch to basic, which is few options. And I have a global tag on and off for global illumination. So let's leave it on and render. This might be what we would expect to see if we've just installed V-Ray and we're rendering a new scene. I'm seeing my sunlight come in and hit the ground. I'm seeing the areas of walls close to where that hits. I am reverberating some light up. And in the deeper areas, I'm seeing less light being bounced, but it's still very bright. Um, if I were to turn my global illumination off and re-render, this is a very dramatic difference. I am getting my direct light on the ground and some direct light on the face of this model, but everywhere that I have shade or shadow, I'm getting no light. And that's because with global illumination turned off, there is no bouncing of light. Light comes from the sun or my light sources and it either hits a surface or it doesn't. It's either bright or dark. And if it hits a surface, but not in full direct direction, it's going to be a shade of gray, let's say. So that's, in a nutshell, what global illumination does. Let's look now at some controls for it. When I turn it on, I have primary and secondary rays. And in fact, I'm going to turn on my advanced settings here. My primary rays are the very first bounce of light, and my secondary rays are my second, third, fourth, and all following. So let me set my secondary to none. And my primary, I'm going to leave on this setting called brute force. Each of these settings is a different way it can be calculated. And so when I render now, my model, my, my image is a little more contrasty. I have the same amount of direct light, but there is less light coming into this space here. And that's because there are no secondary bounces. Light may be bouncing off of the ground and up to this wall but then it stops. It doesn't bounce off of the wall and continue bouncing to add more light into the scene. So brute force is going to give me a very accurate method of finding that light, but it can, when I get to large images, be rather costly in time and computation power. The irradiance map setting is a little overwhelming with its number of controls, but conceptually what it's doing is sampling the space in my model and saving the light for certain regions rather than for every pixel. If brute force checks for every pixel where light is bouncing and is very accurate, the radiance map is sacrificing some of that accuracy for uh, greater speed and some other kind of flexibility options. And what I'm seeing are these little squares. These are called buckets and the buckets are rendering. And as it gets to each bucket, it is kind of sampling light and um, calculating my, my global illumination. And it doesn't look dramatically different at this point in this simple model for my brute force. I may notice that my brute force is more noisy, but this is not um, entirely where the noise is arising from. It's, it's a kind of byproduct of the calculation. So we shouldn't go away from brute force because we, we don't want the noise. Um, we'll find other ways of controlling that. It does take a little longer to resolve often a brute force because it's sampling every second. And again, if I set this to a radiance map, I am now getting a um, 
a bit of a faster rendering, but it is going to be in a smoother rendering, but a little bit less accurate. The third option is light cache, which is another way of caching light, meaning to, to calculate and store light ahead of time, and then um, kind of play it back later as we, we need in the scene. And at least with the default settings, we can begin to see out of the box, this is not providing the same accuracy. It's very quick, but it is sacrificing some details. And that, that has to do maybe with our settings of how many, how many times are we subdividing the scene and how, what sample size are we using to sample the geometry. Um, when you're pre-caching lighting, often you're not picking every single piece of geometry to calculate lighting for. You're picking a region or you're picking a certain kind of sample size in the scene. And so you're going to miss some details and get some irregularities in your lighting. And that's what we begin to see in a radiance map and light cache. There are ways of tuning them, so they're very, very powerful for us. But um, when we kind of render with them without having set those tunings, it's a little easier to see some of the distinct kind of characteristics. So I'm going to set this back to brute force, which is the, the default setting. With many modern computers being so powerful, we can often get away with brute force in this day and age. Render one more time. And now I'm going to set the secondary not, um, let's set that to brute force as well. And let me just stop my rendering by clicking on this little teapot with a red. So when I render now, it's going to do an initial bounce. That primary ray is going to be sampled from every pixel. And it is going to also sample secondary, tertiary, quaternary bounces from every pixel. And this is going to take quite some time to resolve. It's going to be very accurate, but very costly. And I can begin to see some of those, some of the impact of time down here in the lower right corner of my window, where it is giving me feedback on the rendering process. I haven't yet controlled how much time I'm giving it, but I can begin to see when it considers itself having ended that process. And then let's set the secondary to light cache, which often we can get away with a light cache being less accurate for our secondary rays, but it can be far, far more uh, efficient to calculate. So I'm going to leave it on brute force and light cache. That's a nice balance between accuracy with the brute force. That first bounce is going to be very accurate. And then my light cache being um, perfectly reasonable for now for my secondary rays. The caustics I'm going to bypass in this video, this is for focused light passing through transparent materials. So for instance, if there is water with ridges and you get focused kind of beams of light and patterns underneath it, that can be calculated using caustics and GI caustics. And the last thing I want to look at in this video is the ambient occlusion. With GI, especially when it's calculated without tremendous precision, we can begin to lose some detail in shadow areas. It can be challenging to understand where edges are meeting in this inset in the model. Ambient occlusion, if I turn it on, is going to apply a texture that accentuates where there are edges that meet in a model. And it, on the one hand, makes it very easy to understand spatially what's happening in a model, on the other hand, this is looking a little contrived and a little, little self-conscious to me. Ambient occlusion has a radius in our units and an occlusion amount. And if I lower the occlusion amount, it's going to get weaker in its effect and a little less glaring. And if I increase the radius, it looks like this only goes to 10. Let's actually increase it all the way to 12 and render. That is going to make it make these edges a little deeper and wider and a little less focused. So that, in a nutshell, is the beginning of global illumination, the way that I can control primary rays calculation versus secondary rays. I can, let's say, choose none for my secondary rays if I wanted the look of less bounced and reflected light. Also, how to use light cache in my secondary rays to get a... Um, more efficient rendering method. And lastly, using ambient occlusion or not, if 
I want to get some more detail and clarity in where these edges of models and joints are meeting together in my rendered image.